There was a time when Lamborghini was just the name of a humble family from Emilia Romagna, and then it became legend thanks to Ferruccio, a really special man, one of those destined to go down in history. For him, the founder of Lamborghini Automobili in 1963, it was impossible not to move forward, he always had to work, invent, create. His goal was creating cars which were going to represent all the best elements that technology and art offered at that time. With such premises, the most glorious Lamborghini of all times were created, 350 and 400 GT, Mule and Countach. Several years after Automobili Lamborghini was sold from its creator, the house of the Raging Bull needed another flagship car which, for the first time, could have been designed without Ferruccio's contribution. Even though it's been 30 years since the Countach was succeeded, it is only right to ask ourselves a question. Was the transitional Diablo really able to convey the essence typical of all the previous flagship cars of the house of the Raging Bull? After having sold Automobili Lamborghini in 1972 to the Swiss entrepreneurs Rossetti and Leimer, the car manufacturer, which was in a serious economic crisis, was sold again in 1981, but Ferruccio's attempt to rebuy it was destined to fail when he saw his own creation being sold to the Mimmer brothers, two young and passionate French entrepreneurs. Under the leadership of the Mimmer brothers and the president Emile Novaro, in 1985 the Project 132 was started with simple but ambitious goals. Their new car had to be the fastest production car ever made, and it was absolutely necessary for it to be much more comfortable than its ancestor. To do so, the team was led by the engineer Luigi Marmiroli, and the role of designer was given to someone who knew very well the essence of Lamborghini cars, Marcello Gandini. Sandro Munari was the technical advisor, test driver and public relations manager. In fact, it was him who organized the Diablo's official presentation in Monte Carlo in 1990, exactly 30 years ago, while Horacio Pagani gave his contribution to the development of the car, just like he had done before for the Countach by the department of the firm specialized in composite materials. From a technical point of view, the car presents a trellis frame and a double wishbone suspension overlapping with an anti-dive angle and double rear shock absorbers. Even if the VT version was introduced later on, from the very beginning of the Diablo's creation it was equipped with a four-wheel drive system adapting the frame and the other components to this technology. To contain the car's weight, the panels were made of different materials such as steel, aluminium and carbon fiber. To reach the goals they had set, the Diablo's team had to pay great attention to the aerodynamics. A magnificent proof of such attention to the detail is the air diffuser and extractor placed in the rear bumper. We are talking about one of Gandini's masterpieces of aesthetic and craft. It was said that, in order to keep the project secret, a wind tunnel in Paris was used, and the prototype was brought there on a trailer carried by a Volvo station wagon. Such transport mode nearly had dramatic implication when the convoy spun on the way between Saint Agatha and Paris, because of the great instability of the vehicle. Diablo's beating heart was based on the Contact Swan, but was completely renewed, lower and with electronic fuel injection instead of a carburetor system. However, after the road test on the North Loring gave poor results, some changes were made and therefore the car's launch ended up being delayed. In 1987 the final version of its engine was made, recognized as number 522. Diablo's V12 has a 5.7 liter capacity, it's a double overhead camshaft engine with 4 valves per cylinder and it's placed in a longitudinal rear position. This engine's extraordinary power, despite the filter of the catalytic converters, corresponds to 492 horsepower at 4800 rpm and the maximum torque is 580 Nm at 5200 rpm. The engine's power is strongly concentrated on the rear wheels thanks to an excellent 5-speed manual transmission with a beautiful selector shift gate. 
Thanks to these characteristics, the Diablo can go from 0 to 200 km per hour in 4.9 seconds, with a maximum speed of 325 km per hour, as originally planned, the greatest speed ever registered for a production car. The name Diablo was chosen, according to tradition, from the bullfighting context. El Diablo was, indeed, a bull remembered for an epic fight that happened in 1869 in Madrid. The cast design, as previously stated, was created by Gandini, who, for the first time, signed the prototype which he hadn't done with the previous cars, Comtage and Mirror. They, instead, had Bertone Signature, the body shop mechanic Gandini worked for. At the same time, Gandini signs the design of another car, the GZ Molder V16T by the engineer Claudio Zampoli, where it can be easily noticed a resemblance with the Diablo's design, but less refined and elegant than the cars from Sant'Anna Bolognese. When the prototype was almost completely finished, the property of the firm was bought by Chrysler in 1987. The car manufacturer from Detroit tried to heavily change, without being able to do so, the wonderful and well-defined design of the car. The Diablo is a car that immediately draws the attention, it cannot go unnoticed. Its design is characterized by the disproportion of the short front side, followed by a very forward cabin, and the great rear volume clearly makes us understand how the focus of this car lies completely on the engine just like a sharp wedge ready to devour the spot. A recurring detail, typical of the Lamborghini's design, concerns the surface of the lateral windows, which bends up until it becomes horizontal, defining the car's tail. Speaking of flagship cars from Sant'Agata Bolognese, we can consider the Diablo as an ensemble of all the concepts of absolute elegance brought together by Mura and the stylistic fold of the Countach. But the remarkable aesthetical traits of the Diablo are endless, and some of these seem to be in contrast with the bold nature of the car. A clean front side with small vents for the front brakes, a rear fender designed according to the Countach style, the distinctive seesaw doors, Car hood side the flow vents that keep the heat of the engine under control, 17 inches split rims, and a huge spoiler which, I think, perfectly completes the design of the Diablo, giving it the horror like look which marks and defines its real nature. Overall, the Diablo production has around 2,900 cars built between 1990 and 2001, 11 years during which many alternative versions have been created. The VT and the VT Roadster, where VT means viscous traction, a great model that has paved the road for the future supercars. Its viscous coupling four-wheel drive was able to restart up until the 25% of torque on the front wheels. Moreover, the Brembo braking system, the suspension, now electronically adjustable, and the alloy rims were updated. In 1993, the SC30 is created, special edition for the 30th anniversary, lighter and more powerful, now with 525 horsepower and only rear-wheel drive. Only 15 cars were produced with the 600 horsepower Yota kit to take part in GT races. The SV, super veloce, super fast, was updated both technically and aesthetically. One of these updates was, in 1998, the replacement of pop-up headlights with the fixed ones. The 1999 Diablo GT, with a 6-liter 575-horsepower engine, the Millennium Roadster and the VT Special Edition 2 engine style after 11 years of success. Once Lamborghini was assimilated by the American Chrysler, the styling center in Detroit cooperated with Gandini to make some minor changes on the external design. While the interiors went through to a substantial redesign which, in retrospect, has probably made the cabin more usable and functional. When we get in through the characteristic scissor doors, we realize that every surface is covered with soft leather and the red sea stages, matching with the car body, represent a pleasantly elegant touch. The characteristic high dashboard from the first version really stands out. Even if from outside and from the passenger side we have the impression that it takes all the available space, once we sit on the driver's seat we find out that it's not bothering and doesn't block the view. 
The solution was the result of a study by Professor Renato Meduri, lecturer in physiopathological optics at the University of Bologna, who thought it was more advisable to put the main tools externally to the perimeter of the steering wheel. The quality and ergonomics levels we perceive are really high, especially when we compare them to those of other contemporary supercars. The only criticism we can make about the internal space concerns a slight offset to the right of the pedals and a little room for the head, which often hits the lateral side of the lucky well padded roof, which is also covered with soft leather. The interior proves to be roomy and the external visibility is good, despite the distortion caused by the greatly tilted windshield. The central tunnel is impressive and it starts from the original container in which the seat belts often get stuck. From the rear window we can see the huge engine hood and the exceptional distinctive spoiler. When driving we immediately have to calculate the space we have because the cabin is structured so that the most voluminous part of the car is in the back. The steering wheel is low and this creates a little bit of discomfort to the legs, but it's easy to control mostly thanks to the power steering system installed on this car. The gear shift is beautiful and easily manoeuvrable, thanks to its long shifter and the selector shift gate. The first gear is placed in a lower position, just like racing cars, so that the second and the third gear are aligned, just like the fourth and the fifth. The clutch pedal is unexpectedly soft, while the gas pedal is heavy, and the brake pedal is not as intuitive as one may think. The AC system is a real weak spot for the comfort level of this car, after some minutes it stops working properly. The suspension is quite rigid and therefore the car doesn't swing nor roll too much, and obviously it makes it easy to feel any road roughness. The engine is the real protagonist of this wonderful ensemble. Its almost 500 horsepower produces a strong and powerful sound. When it goes over 4000 rpm the car's rumble becomes amazingly thunderous inside of the cabin. Despite its sport nature the V12 is unexpectedly agile and extremely usable at every speed it contributes to making the Diablo together with all of its components pleasant, powerful, direct and authentic. In all of these aspects it reminds us of someone who many years ago created its ancestors, Ferruccio Lamborghini. It's not a coincidence if this car can be considered a fully fledged symbol of the 90s, which rapidly became part of the pop culture, appearing on memorable video game covers such as Need for Speed, Hot Pursuit, and by being chosen as protagonist for some famous music videos, like Cosmic Girl by Jamiro Quaid. Among the many stories about this car, there's an interesting anecdote about a former rally world champion, Sandro Munari, who, despite having been retired for 10 years, took part to the Targa Tasmania in 1994, driving a Diablo VT, which was basically a production car, and still managed to win the third place. This example of style and high performance technology must be considered elegant and fully advanced just like the Lamborghini cars which were created by the founder were supposed to be. And, as a consequence, to answer the question we asked ourselves at the beginning, we can say that there is no doubt about the Diablo being considered a Lamborghini car with the DNA and the essence that Ferruccio wanted, while keeping the quintessential characteristics of the house of the raging bull. Now it's time to say some special thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank Andrea Nicoletto, president of the Lamborghini Club Italia and owner of this wonderful Diablo, bought 25 years ago directly from Alpine, Lamborghini's historical partner, which also used this car as a model for their official posters back then. Thanks to Circolo Patavino Auto Storiche that allows us to know and share its immense car culture. Thanks to Alessandro Cester and Dario Ruffato for the technical service, to Chiara Barbato for the translation service. Finally, thanks to all of you for watching this video. I hope you all enjoy it and share it so that we can keep creating new contents. Thanks again and see you soon.